Turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. Last week we looked at the account in which the Lord heals 10 lepers in Luke 17. And we are going to back up today into the Old Testament, but we're going to continue to look at leprosy as it's described for us in Scripture, both as a type of sin. And what the incidents, there's several incidents where a person is cleansed from leprosy. And we're going to look at, over the course of the next few sessions, what that has to tell us about forgiveness and cleansing. We're going to begin this morning with a review of what we considered last week. Leprosy typifies sin in Scripture, both in its outward ugliness and its inward corruption. Another thing that we saw was that in biblical times, leprosy was incurable apart from divine intervention. I don't know about with modern medical science, but I know that back in in those days, leprosy was an incurable disease. Another thing we saw is that leprosy is a sign of God's judgment on sin. It was a form of God's judgment in at least two cases. We looked at one last time, that was the case when God judged Miriam, the sister of Moses, by striking her with leprosy after she questioned the singular authority of Moses in the dispensation of the law. That account is in Numbers 12. The second time that uh, came to my mind was a man named Gehazi. And we're going to take a look at him. But before we do that, we have to consider the account of a man named Naaman. I hope you're all in 2 Kings chapter 5 by now. We're going to pick up reading in verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now most of you are probably familiar with this passage. If you're not, here's a spoiler. By the time the passage is over, Naaman will be cured of his leprosy. There's a few things that we learn about Naaman from this verse. These things are important for our study today and they're going to be important for our overall study going forward. The first thing is that Naaman was a Gentile. One of the things I mentioned last week is that with the exception of Miriam, we don't see a single Jew cleansed of leprosy in the entire Old Testament. And Miriam's case was exceptional. But here with Naaman, we're going to see a Gentile cured from leprosy. How does that square with the first reference on your sheet, which tells us the condition of the Gentiles when the law of Moses was in effect? Ephesians 2, 11 and 12 says that Gentiles were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And we're going to try and answer this question why was Naaman cured when we don't see any Jews cured as we go forward in our study. The next point we see about Naaman is that he was a Syrian. And Syrians were the enemies of Israel. And Naaman was the captain of Syria's armies. He was the head guy. Another thing we see is that in human terms, Naaman was an impressive guy. Verse 1 tells us that he was a great man and honorable. 
and a mighty man of valor. And I think that there are many men, even believers, who would love to have that as part of their epitaph. Great man, honorable, mighty man of valor. Another thing this verse tells us is that on at least one occasion, God had used Naaman. It says in verse 1 that he used him to give deliverance unto Syria. And one of the reasons I took the time to list all of these things about Naaman is because when Naaman is cured, it's in spite of the negative things about him, and it is in no way because of the positive things about him. They don't enter into the equation. Both of those things will be clear by the time we get to the end of the account. So reading on in verse 2, it says that the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. Now this would make the case against Naaman even stronger. As Syria's captain, the leader of Syria's armies, he would obviously have been in command of this military operation. He was responsible for actual depredations against Israel. And since the healing of leprosy in Scripture represents cleansing from sin, now is a good time to look at the next reference. Romans 5.10, which says that when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Verse 2 also introduces us to what I think is the most remarkable person in this account. The little maid, a captive of the Syrians, and a slave. She's a slave, not just of any Syrian, but of Naaman's wife. This little maid had been ripped from her family and her home, her traditions and her religion, and she's been forced into servitude in the home of the very man that was responsible for that. If anyone has a reason to hate Naaman and wish the worst on him, it's her. But let's see how she reacts to this situation in verse 3. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Look at what the maid says. Read it again. Look at how it's just kind of it's, it's punctuated with an exclamation point, and it starts with the word "would." Would my would God, my Lord, were with the prophet? You see, her desire—it's her prayer—that Naaman be healed. Would you have that wish for the person who was personally responsible for your enslavement? Paul tells us, this isn't on your sheet, but Paul tells us in Romans 12, 13, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. And as I was thinking about this, you know, we, we think of, uh, you know, someone was sp spoke a cross word to me, and that's what this talks about. I should bless them and not curse them. But this, it goes much deeper than that. Here we have an example in Scripture of this little maid with this type of attitude for the man that was responsible for her enslavement. One thing I think this tells us about Naaman is that while he was obviously a ruthless man in war, I think we can infer from this that he was probably a fair man in the way he treated his slaves. In verse 1, we read that he was an honorable man. Also, I want you to notice that in verse 2, it refers to Naaman's wife. Singular. Scripture's not shy about pointing out the sins and flaws of people. So I think we can infer from this that Naaman was a man of one wife. 
And even though he's a Gentile, even though he's an enemy of Israel, we read of a lot of Jews in the Old Testament that could have learned from him in that regard. So I think sometimes when we look at people in, in Scripture and are tempted to judge them, we have to be a little careful. But getting back to the little maiden, not only does this maiden seem to care deeply that Naaman be cured, she's also expressing great faith. Let's read again what she says in verse 3. Would that my Lord were with the prophet in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. There's no doubt in her mind. And this is a remarkable statement for a couple reasons. First of all, later on in the account, we're going to see her faith contrasted with that of the king of Israel. And her faith is strong, and we're going to see that his faith was weak. But another thing we need to, re to see from this is that she's declaring something that she believes will happen. Naaman will be recovered from his leprosy. And as I've mentioned before, this is something that's never happened. She would have never seen this. She would have never heard about this. Moses never cured anyone. None of the prophets. Nobody had ever cured anyone from leprosy before. And yet we have this little maid in captivity demonstrating this faith. And she's not demonstrating faith in the prophet, even though she says the prophet will heal him. She's demonstrating faith in God. We don't have time to explore this in our current study, but she reminds me a bit, as in her position as a slave, she reminds me a bit of Joseph and Daniel. You see, what she says here is really kind of precious. She's demonstrating that childlike faith that we're all called to demonstrate by the Lord. But every time we see one of God's people accomplishing great things, such as Joseph and Daniel, when they're in captivity, they're not only being faithful to God, but they're serving their human masters to the best of their ability as well. Paul references this many times, not just with respect to slavery, but to all of our relationships, whether it's in our families, in the church, with people at work, <coughs> such as with a boss that you may not like. We certainly don't have time to get into the topic of slavery. Uh, slavery still exists in many parts of the world today. In every case I can think of, it's absolutely evil. It should be resisted. If possible, those living in slavery should be delivered. But back in biblical times, slavery was a widespread practice. It was very common. It was even common in what was considered the civilized world. God allowed slavery back then as a legitimate form of paying off a debt. And to those slaves, Paul said this in the next reference. Titus 2.9 Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, to please them, not talking back. And as I was looking for a reference to use there, I was surprised at just how many times Paul referenced this topic. And here we have this little maiden demonstrating these biblical principles. So let's read on in verse 4. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. It seems to me that this maid was so remarkable that she was known in Syria as the maid that is of Israel. 
we're, we're already seeing here that she wasn't bashful about talking about her faith. So again, I think we have more evidence here that in captivity she was a lot like Daniel or Joseph. Verse 5 says that the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him, and watch this, this is important, ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. Now we're going to consider the wealth that he took with him in a little bit more detail later on. And it's a considerable amount of wealth. See, Naaman is not aware of how this is going to work. He thinks that he's going to have to bring something in order to get his miracle. But he does know this much. Both Naaman and the king of Syria show some sense of the overall spiritual situation here as it relates to approaching God. As Gentiles, they're approaching the God of Israel. And they're going to go through what they perceive to be the proper authority in Israel. They're going to go through the Jewish king. Verse 6 says that he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant unto thee, that thou, the king of Israel, mayest recover him from his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeks a quarrel against me. The king's mind is that they're doing this and the king's not going to be able to cure him, so it's going to be cause for war. Earlier I mentioned that the little maid, I think, is the most remarkable person in this account. The king, I think, is the least impressive at least as far as what we're considering. But isn't this often how it is in the economy of God? Now the king of Israel at this time was a man named Jehoram. We know this from 2 Kings chapter 3. The history of his reign seems to have been a mixed bag. He was far from perfect, but he also seems to have been far from the worst king that Israel had. But he here, he doesn't come across in a real good light. He shows both a lack of faith and a lack of understanding. He believes that this whole thing is a ruse, that it's designed to provoke war. He doesn't even refer Naaman to Elisha. It never even enters his mind to do so. This is apparent from verse 8. Before we read verse 8, I think that this shows that the king does not think that God or God's prophet would stoop so low as to help this Gentile enemy of Israel. So he doesn't have a correct understanding of God. But you know what? He does get one thing right. He asks the question, Am I God to kill and to make alive? You see, he knows that this man has leprosy, and he knows that this man cannot be cured, except by God. Am I God? Verse 8 says, And it was so, when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, so somehow word gets to Elisha, but I get the impression here it's not from the king. The king is is satisfied if this doesn't go any further. So Elisha sends word back to the king and he says, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come to me, Naaman, let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Now in a sense, the king is right. 
Our next reference is going to show that, in a sense, he's right. But he's right for the wrong reasons. He's right for the wrong reasons, and he's not responding correctly to what he understands. But our next reference is Mark 7.27. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. Now here in Mark, we have the Lord addressing a Gentile woman. She's desired healing for her daughter. And the Lord is responding in a proper dispensational sense. Now, of course, we know that he does heal the woman's daughter. But only after the woman recognizes her position as a Gentile in the kingdom economy, that she has to come to God through Israel. Consider what the next reference tells us that Gentiles will have to do to be saved in the kingdom. Zechariah 8.23 says that they will have to take hold of the skirt of a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. In Isaiah 49.6, I did not put this on your sheet, but it, it's a prophetic passage about the future kingdom. And we read that Israel will be a light unto the Gentiles. But you know something? We, we, we think of that prophetically, that it's going to happen in the future, that Israel will be a light to the Gentiles. But that's always been their job. They were always supposed to be a light unto the Gentiles. And countless times in Scripture we see Israel or specific people from Israel, such as Jonah, refusing to do their job to be a light unto the Gentiles. But that's always been what they were supposed to do. If Gentiles came seeking salvation, Israel was supposed to lead them to salvation. And what I want to do now is take a moment to consider the major players in this narrative that we've seen so far. How do they stack up to this? Naaman is a Gentile. He's coming to Israel to be healed of leprosy. So he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. Cleansing from leprosy represents le cleansing from sin. The little maid represents the proper response. The response that's implied in Zechariah 8.23. She's pointing Naaman where he has to go to be cured. The king of Israel represents the Israel that we see so often in Scripture, the Israel that is negligent in the responsibility of being a light unto the Gentiles. And Elisha, we're going to see, he represents godly Israel. He's acting on God's behalf as God's representative to provide access to God to the Gentiles for cleansing. In contrast to our present dispensation of, de of grace today, Gentiles had to come through Israel. Verse 9 says that Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a message unto him. Elisha doesn't go. This is an important point. Elisha sends a message saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Now imagine if you're Naaman. What would your response be to that? And before we look at that, I just I have another thing that I just want to point out. The only one that Naaman has actually dealt with so far from Israel is the little maid. And even that, he may not have spoken to her. She may have spoken to the wife who may have spoken to Naaman. The king doesn't really give him an audience. And now Elisha's just sending a messenger out. 
They don't see Him personally. The only one that He's got to rely on the word of a person is the little maid. We're going to see as we go through this that what Naaman eventually does takes great faith. But he doesn't get there yet. Verse 11 says that he was angry. And he went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And I want to take a little bit of time to break down these two verses. Look at what Naaman says in verse 11. He will surely come out to me. Remember what we saw about Naaman in verse 1. Naaman was an impressive guy and he obviously believed the press about himself. He obviously thought he was an impressive guy. He had just recently raided Israel and taken captives. Surely the people of Israel must be afraid of him. Surely their prophet is going to jump at this opportunity to come out and meet with me. He's going to do something for me in order to curry my favor. Here's a chance for them to get me on their good side. He obviously feels the same way about the Lord. That the Lord should react in such a visible, spectacular way because it's me. It's Naaman. I deserve an impressive response from the Lord. A lot of people, I think, feel that way today. And I want you to think about that. He knows his condition. Nobody knows that he has leprosy better than him. He has, he's coming seeking an audience with the prophet of Israel. He's the one that needs the miracle. He should be coming with his hat in his hand. And yet he expects Elisha to come out and meet him on his terms. But he doesn't get that. Instead, he gets a message sent to him from Elisha, not by Elisha. And that message is real simple. Go and wash in the Jordan River. Now what Naaman says about the rivers of Damascus in verse 12, I think makes it clear that he understands one thing. That his deliverance from leprosy is only available in Israel because he already could have gone and bathed in the waters of Damascus. He knows that's not going to work. But right now, as far as we've gotten in our reading, he's not at the point that he's willing to accept what Elisha says. When he says of the rivers of his homeland, may I not wash in them? And then he turns away from Elisha and begins to go away in a rage. He's turning his back on the one way that God has sent forth for him to be cleansed from his leprosy. And I think the parallel should be obvious. If someone rejects Jesus Christ today in his finished work in favor of their own strength, their own efforts, their own impressiveness. Again, I, think the, I don't think I need to elaborate on that. The parallel should be obvious. However, those who come to God on the terms that He sets forth, God will never turn away. But Naaman, right now, he's one of those that expects God to be impressed with them. Who expects God to meet them on their terms. 
When Naaman says, are not the rivers of Damascus better? How many people today believe that the ways of the world are better and more important than the ways of God? Sometimes, sadly, even believers. How often do we make bad choices with our time? So he turned and he went away in a rage. And look at the next reference. Psalm 2, 1 and 2. Why do the heathen rage? And the kings of the earth set themselves against the Lord and against His anointed. Right now, this describes both the person of Naaman and his actions. This is another thing that's beyond the scope of our current series, but I'll just mention that Psalm 2 is dispensational. It's a very important psalm for you to understand. It's prophetic in nature. The part that I quoted deals primarily with God's dealings with the Gentiles. There's also a part that deals with Israel. As groups of people. And yet, in Naaman, and sometimes in our own lives, and certainly in the lives of people we see around us, we have examples of people who act exactly in this manner. They rage against the Lord. They set themselves against the Lord. They make a conscious decision. And yet, and here's something encouraging... Naaman still ends up being cleansed. I think that tells us a lot. God is long-suffering. Every one of us has until the very end of our lives. I shared, I'm not going to go into detail, but I shared how I, sh I shared before how I shared the gospel with my father-in-law on his deathbed. And I believe he trusted Christ right before he died. And I'm no one special. And look what happens with Naaman. Because thankfully for Naaman, he had people with him who had a little more discernment. And once again, it's, it's not Naaman's main lieutenant... It's not a great person in human terms that changes Naaman's mind. It's a lowly person. And that's why, and, I, and I'm not speaking in false humility here when I talk about my father in law. We're all just servants of Almighty God. And look who intercedes with Naaman here. Verse 13 And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, my father, if the prophet had bidden thee to do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? And I think we can come away from this verse with a realization that there were many great things that Naaman could have done. He had the power and the authority and the influence to do a lot of great things. Things that could have benefited the nation of Israel. <coughs> And I think the, the passage is clear. He was willing to do this in order to be cleansed. How much rather then, when he saith to thee, simply wash and be clean. In other words, in order to be cleansed, Naaman has to humble himself. He has to let go of the fact that he's a great man that can do great things. You see, to reach a position like the one that Naaman had in Syria... That requires a great deal of ability and self-confidence. And Naaman has to reject all of that about himself to do what the prophet tells him to do. Not only does he have to forsake doing anything that has to do with his own power, his own strength or his own effort, he has to wash in, in Israel, not in Syria. There's nothing in the world system out there that has the power to save anyone. It's always been true. 
Naaman has to act on faith, on the word of a man. Remember, Elisha hasn't come out. He's got to act in faith on the word of a man that he has not even seen. He has to trust that the one who brought him the message is acting on behalf of the prophet. There's a lot of faith involved here. You know, this could I could see this. This could very easily have been someone who thought, you know, I'm going to have a joke at this guy's expense. He thinks he's so great. I'm going to go and have him stripped out and go into the Jordan River and sit there behind the rocks watching and say, oh, he's actually doing it. Naaman has to trust that he's not being played for a fool here. What he did took a lot of faith. Verse 14 says that he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a child. And he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. And before we look at Elisha's response, I want you to look again on your sheet at Zechariah 8.23. Because it tells us what the Gentiles will be bringing in their hands when they seek the Lord through Israel. You look at that verse again, you see there's only one thing that will be in their hands. And this, I think, is speaking figuratively, so really there's nothing. But the one thing in their hands is the skirt of a Jew. Other than that, they're coming empty-handed. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. You see, when Naaman sets out on this journey... He's far from empty-handed. He's bringing with him considerable wealth. In verse 15 here we read that he's willing to part with this wealth. He's willing to part with it in response to being healed. But the overall sense in the passage is that he was willing to dispense this wealth in order to be Healed. He was willing to buy himself a miracle, to buy his cleansing. He was obviously willing to pay a considerable sum. And there's another parallel. There's obviously a lot of people like that today who are willing to buy the Lord's favor, to do something to impress the Lord so that they can be healed, cleansed. It's interesting that very few of them are looking for salvation. They are looking for physical healing, bettering of their financial services uh, situation, things like that. I've served on prayer teams. Those are the types of things people come in looking for. Last week we saw that in Scripture leprosy typifies sin. And I know I keep saying that, but you got to get it. We saw that a person who had leprosy would have been considered to be under the judgment of God. In the eyes of Hebrews at that time, who would have deserved to be under God's judgment more than Naaman? Probably no one. And yet, Elisha, God's prophet, heals Naaman. He heals the enemy of God's people. He does it free of charge. Naaman brings a considerable sum and it doesn't enter into the equation except in one really important way. Let's read verse 16 and then I'll elaborate. This is Elisha talking. He says, As the Lord liveth... Before whom I stand, in other words, I'm standing as the Lord's representative. I will receive none. And Naaman urged him, take it, take it. 
But he refused. You see, this passage, from a godly perspective, this passage lists all of Naaman's wealth for a reason. And did you catch what it is? It's there to be rejected. Here's another thing you need to recognize about this account. Naaman is a Gentile. As such, he was not under the law of Moses. For example, when the Lord heals people, heals lepers, they're told, go show yourself to the priest. Naaman's not told that. All he had to do was respond in faith to the word of the Lord and wash in the Jordan, and he was cleansed. And yet, again, I reiterate, how many people today are willing to do something to either buy their salvation or earn their salvation? And how many turn away in anger when they hear the truth of the gospel? How many people allow their human pride to prevent them from recognizing their hopelessly lost condition who are totally unable to accept that there's nothing they can do? They can't even help God save them, much less save themselves. I've confessed, confessed this before from the pulpit, but personal one-on-one -on -one witnessing is not my strong suit. But I have done it. And the most common objections to the gospel I hear revolve around human pride. They're either along the lines of, I'm a good person, or I've never relied on anyone for anything in my life and I'm not about to start now, which of course is uh, either a lie or self-delusion. So when you think about it, the transformation that occurs in Naaman, uh, forget the fact that he's cleansed of leprosy, but the transformation in his attitude between verse 12 where he's in a rage and verse 14 where he humbles himself and bathes in the Jordan is a remarkable transformation. And Naaman said, verse 17, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two mules burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods but the Lord. And the weight of the evidence of this passage indicates, I think, that we're going to see Naaman in heaven. He responded in faith to what the Lord told him to do. He exhibited great humility in doing so. The next reference on your sheet is 1 Corinthians 1.26, which says that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And that verse describes Naaman. Most people like that are unable to humble themselves. But Naaman did. The next reference applies here as well. Mark 10, 24 and 25. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. We looked at this a while back on a Wednesday when we looked at the account of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler was unwilling to give up his wealth. Naaman was willing to give up his wealth, but he trusted in his wealth. The rich young ruler walked away. At the end of the day, Naaman was able to give up his faith in his wealth. Running out of time. Verse 18, In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimon to worship there, and he lean on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. Now Naaman did not get where he was by not being pragmatic. He knows that he's going to go back to Syria and he's going to have to accompany the king into the temple of a false god. He's asking the Lord's pardon for that in advance. Now some may say that this indicates that he wasn't truly saved, but I think it's more in the lines of a new, immature, compromising believer. And I base that not just on what we've already seen, I think that's strong enough, but look what he's told by Elisha in the next verse. And he said unto him, 
Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. Now next week we're going to get into the sad tale of Gehazi. And we're going to flesh out Naaman's story a little more. I want to close tonight by looking back at verse 14, the end of the verse. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. The cleansing of Naaman is a picture of the believer's cleansing from sin. His flesh became like unto the flesh of a little child. Think about that because it's important. It didn't become as it was as an adult before he got leprosy. It didn't go back to an aged state that was just cleansed of leprosy with all of the other normal wear and tear that comes with age. He was completely cleansed and restored. None of the effects of living in a sin-cursed world were there. Not just the fact that leprosy was cured. Over and over in our study of Luke on Wednesday nights, we've seen that whenever the Lord heals somebody physically, He feel, heals them completely. And He deals the same way with our sin. We're going to close with the last few references. Now the fact that Naaman washed in water does not mean that a person has to be water baptized today. Pastor Kurth just did several weeks on water baptism and I'm not going to redo that. Our next reference tells us what cleanses us today and it's not water. 1 John 1.7 says it's the blood of Jesus Christ which cleanses us from all sin. In Romans 5.10 on your sheet, we already saw that like us, Naaman was cleansed when he was an enemy. We've also seen in our passage that he was helpless to cleanse himself despite all of his human prowess and wealth. That applies to us as well. Next reference, Romans 5.6. For yet when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And when you consider being ungodly, Naaman was in a sense twice ungodly. He was ungodly because he was a sinner, but he was also ungodly because he was a Gentile. He was outside the covenant. He had no access to God. Last reference, Isaiah 118. Though your sins be scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be as crimson, they shall be as wool. See, that's how God cleanses us from our sin, the same way he cleansed Naaman from his leprosy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the fact that we were able to gather here today to come and study your word and to learn more about your son. We're thankful for the examples you give us in scripture of many different people in different stages of life and stations in society and what we can learn about them and apply to our lives. Most of all, Father, we're thankful that we have a cleansing spiritually that's like the cleansing typified in Naaman's cleansing, that you take every spot and blemish of our sin. And when we come to you in simple faith in the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again, you wipe us and wash us completely clean and you give us completely new garments of righteousness, your righteousness, righteousness that can never be stained again. And as such, we are eternally and totally secure in your hands. We're thankful for that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.